welcome to Dispatches from India, a show by People's Dispatch, where we bring you news about the politics, economy and society of the country, as well as what Indians have been talking about over the past week. Our first section is the news this week. Our first story here is about the GDP numbers or the gross domestic product numbers. The first numbers for the first quarter of 2021 were released and here we mean the April to June period of this year. The numbers were in some senses a relief and the country's GDP growth was at 20.1%. Now this was compared to the same quarter in the previous year which was disastrous. In April to June 2020, the GDP had contracted by 24.4%. Thus the baseline for this year was very low to begin with. The fact that India's economy is a long way to go is clear from two facts. As the media outlet Scroll pointed out, in terms of actual numbers, there was a 16.9% contraction in the April to June quarter as opposed to the previous three months. And now there's also the fact that the actual numbers of April to June 2021 were also 9.2% below the equivalent figures in the pre-pandemic April to June quarter, that's 2019. This means that the Indian economy is actually smaller today than it was two years ago. Besides, rural inflation means that even the growth in income of farmers has not helped much. Clearly, we have a long way to go before the Indian economy is back on track. Our next story is about a High Court verdict and this is the Allahabad High Court in the state of Uttar Pradesh. Now the judge suggested that the cow should be declared the national animal and that the protection of the cow should be a fundamental right for the Hindu community. This is a controversial topic in India because many sections of the Hindu community consider the cow a sacred animal even as beef consumption also takes place in the country. The court made these claims, noting the, noting the religious and cultural significance of cows, while denying bail to a Muslim man who has been in jail since March for allegedly having stolen and slaughtered a cow. In recent years, there have both been laws that restrict the sale of cattle and vigilante actions by groups who have attacked and in some cases even killed people, mostly Muslims, for being involved in the sale of beef. In this case, the court even had some scientific observations. We talked to scriptwriter and stand-up artist Warren Grover on this issue. Cows have been uh, much discussed in India in the last few years. Cow, the most gentle of animals, has become a symbol of aggressive majoritarian politics and often violent mob rule in India has been carried out in the name of the cow in the last few years. Now, people have been routinely lynched over suspicions of carrying beef and the killings have been justified by majority. Uh, people in respectable positions of power and influence have repeatedly made unscientific claims about the magical powers of cows, uh, cow dung, cow urine, cow milk, etc. Now, recently a court judge even said that cows inhale and exhale oxygen, hence they should be given the status of national animal. I think if this statement is scientifically true, which it is not, the truth is that all animals actually inhale and exhale oxygen in some portion, like the exhalation includes a lot, large chunk of carbon dioxide also. But this judge kind of uh, suggests that cows are the only animal that exhale oxygen and probably his belief is that cows exhale only oxygen and no other gas. So if this guy is, uh, and so he said that cows inhale and exhale oxygen and hence they should be given the status of national animal. Now if this statement is scientifically true, which it is not, then uh, I would say not only national animal cows deserve to be given the status of a global animal. They could be our biggest weapon against climate change. But unfortunately, the truth is cows are living in horrible conditions. The dairy industry, which is like very, very pre prevalent in India, the dairy industry, much like the meat industry in America, is built on cruelty against animals. So yeah, I mean, cows may flourish as symbols for political gain, but uh, sadly, their real condition uh, remains horrible. And finally, every year, September 5th, the birthday of Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, the second president of India, is celebrated as Teachers' Day. Now, as the name suggests, the day celebrates the contributions of teachers to the development of both individuals and societies. However, what happens when the education system of the country itself is in shambles? We speak to Dr. Abba Dev Habib, a professor at Delhi University and a member of the Delhi Teachers Forum, who discusses the adverse impact of the national education policy. This policy has been introduced by the central government. She also talks about the general state of teachers in the country. When we 
हर रोज़ सेलिब्रेट नहीं कर रहे होते तो एक तरीके से एक तरीके से एक दिखावे की तरह हो जाता है कि एक दिन उसके लिए निर्धारित कर दिया जाए और वहाँ सेलिब्रेशन हो जब मोदी आए उन्होंने विश्व गुरु की बात की लेकिन अगर हम लगातार देखें जो हालात हैं उसमें कोई सुधार नहीं है बल्कि आप देखेंगे कि नंबर ऑफ़ टीचर्स वर्किंग ऑन कॉन्ट्रैक्ट बेसिस इज़ ओनली इंक्रीज परमानेंट नौकरियां नहीं लगी हैं लगभग 10 लाख नौकरियां खाली पड़ी हैं स्कूलों में और खुद सरकारी डाटा जो फिलहाल जुलाई में पार्लियामेंट में पेश हुआ जिस पर भी मैं बात रखूँगी उसके अनुसार भी 6000 सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटीज़ की पोस्ट खाली हैं स्कूल और कॉलेजेस uh, में जो समस्याएं थीं पेंडेमिक के समय ऑनलाइन शिक्षा हुई uh, कितने बच्चों को शिक्षा मिल पाई उनके पास कोई सुविधा थी कि नहीं थी क्या सरकार ने उसमें इनपुट डाला क्या ऐसा हुआ कि जो क्रोनी कैपिटल्स हैं उन्होंने ही सोशल uh, उसके नाम पर कि हम एक सोसाइटी uh, को कंट्रीब्यूट करें क्या उन्होंने आ, कहीं किसी गांव को किसी सब अर्बन एरिया को अडॉप्ट करके लैपटॉप्स या नेटबुक्स या एंड्रॉयड फ़ोन ही बांटे हों तो ये सोचने की बात है ऐसा कुछ नहीं हुआ लोगों को अपनी गाय बेच के अपने बच्चे की पढ़ाई करवानी पड़ी तब सरकार बजाय इन चीज़ों को इमीडिएट चीज़ों को देखे उसने पार्लियामेंट को दरकिनार करते हुए एन को पास किया इग्नो जो एक ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी है वहाँ पर फोर्टी फोर स्टूडेंट्स को वो डिग्री दे रहे हैं आ, आ, उनके स्टूडेंट्स एनरोल्ड हैं लेकिन हम देखते हैं कि वहाँ पे सिर्फ जो फैकल्टी नंबर है वो ढाई सौ तीन सौ है तो आप देखो कि क्या स्टूडेंट टीचर रेशो है ताकि हम स्टूडेंट टीचर रेशो की बात ना करें ताकि हम इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर की बात ना करें सरकार इस तरीके के मॉडल लेकर आ रही है ताकि उसका इनपुट जो है वो कम हो जाए और जो डिग्रीज़ हैं वो पेपर डिग्रीज़ हो जाएंगी तो आ, मुझे लगता है कि एक दिन सेलिब्रेट कर लेने से आ, लोगों की ज़िंदगियों पे कोई इम्पैक्ट नहीं है और सरकार अगर सचमुच विश्व गुरु बनना चाहती है अगर सरकार सचमुच टीचर्स को सेलिब्रेट करना चाहती है तो रिफॉर्म्स जो हैं पुख्ता होने होंगे वी नाउ मूव टू और इन फोकस सेक्शन वे वी टेक डीपर लुक एट सम इशूज ऑन द माइंड ऑफ इंडियंस Our first story unfortunately is about violence and hate. Now India has always had a huge problem of violence stemming from inter-religious rivalry. In most cases it's the minority communities that's Muslims and Christians who are at the receiving end. Now this animosity between religions was stoked by the British during the colonial rule as part of their divide and rule policy. After independence it was continued by various political forces which saw electoral benefit from the strategy. The Bharatiya Janata Party the BJP which is in power right now in the center has as its ideological parent an organization called the RSS which advocates the idea of India being a Hindu nation ever since the BJP came to power in 2014 many experts have pointed to a general sense of insecurity faced by religious minorities this is also due to the fact that there have been many attacks violence intimidation threats etc over the past few weeks yet again there have been a few instances of such attacks on muslims senior journalist anindya chakravarti analyzes these attacks and why society at large seems to not rise up in protest against them the, the bigger question of course is why are these attacks on ordinary muslims more importantly why is there such support for attacks on such people these are poor people ordinary people these are underdogs these are people you would normally feel sympathy for what kind of uh, what kind of a mentality makes people happy when these people are attacked beaten or humiliated now uh, you know i have never been able to understand this from my own standpoint because when people say oh muslims have been appeased they've been given a lot of uh, you know support by the state by the nehruvian state by indira gandhi by the gandhis the nehru gandhi family by the congress then i my instinct is to say what kind of rubbish is this this is utter rubbish because around me i know that there are very few Muslims in positions of power positions of authority whether you look at the bureaucracy whether you look at doctors lawyers you look at uh, the various uh, government organizations Muslims are underrepresented and this is not just some kind of uh, uh, you know my own impression the various commissions which have looked into it the various assessments that have been done studies that have been done surveys that have been done have all said that this is true this is what has been happening now one reason why there is this angst on the ground uh, on the on the street is because ironically 
because salary jobs have come down and you would say why should that matter uh, it's not as if muslims ever had salary jobs well that is precisely the reason why muslims have been relatively immune to the slowdown that has taken place in india the economic slowdown that has taken place in india over the last 10 years and which is uh, accelerated over the last five six years overall there's been a 1.7 percent drop in total number of employed in india between 2016-17 to 2019-20 remember this is despite population increasing there's been a drop if i look at hindus that drop is even bigger it's 2.2 percent uh, this data is available for subscribers to cmi useful data uh, when I look at the drop in numbers of those who are Muslim, employment numbers for those who are Muslim, it is just 0.1%. Why has that happened? Because Muslims are occupy, ha, take up occupations and professions which are not related to what is happening to the government space. So when the state withdraws, when the government withdraws from the economy, salary jobs go down, when contractual jobs become easier to give when there's a slowdown in the organized sector what happens is that jobs are lost hate however is not only a product of politics the economic situation on the ground may play a factor too on this show we have talked about how the pandemic has worsened the condition of many with tens of thousands losing their lives and hundreds of thousands losing their jobs or suffering economic crisis let's take a look at how this factors into the politics of hate let's look at what happened in the second lockdown uh, between April and May this year, Hindus saw just a 2.4% drop in employment, while Muslims saw a sharp 14% decline. There was 14% drop. Again, as I said, lockdown comes, those who have salaried or regular jobs are less likely to be thrown out immediately, but those who are dependent on providing daily services or have small businesses which run on, uh, which depend on daily customers, they are affected the most. So 14% drop. And when the lockdown opened. So let's look at the compare June and July. The upper caste Hindus continued to see a drop in employment. 8.1% drop between June and July for upper caste Hindus. But what happens to Muslims? Muslim, employment of Muslims increased between June and July by 36%. That is the dramatic increase. So again, as the economy is more and more moving towards lower income uh, providing gig economy, service sector economy, employment, the skew of employment has changed completely, right? So Muslims tend to be, had adopted to already to a self-employment mode of existence, which is low income. Remember, self, those who are self-employed earn about half of what those who are salaried earn. This is government data about half or even less than that uh, the uh, Muslims being more in uh, I'm, uh, you know in tune with self-employment having adopted it much earlier than Hindus what has happened is that for an unemployed educated Hindu often upper caste and intermediate caste what happens is that they see that these Muslims have jobs they're getting married they're bike, buying a new bike they're roaming around wearing new jeans. They have work. They're earning. Nothing has happened to them. Why are we unemployed? It is a great ground, a great ground to create hatred and enmity. It's a great ground to tell them that, look, the Muslims have jobs because they were appeased. The Congress government appeased them, worked for you and did not work for you who are the majority. You are in a subjugated position, not because of today, but because of what happened thousand years ago. You are in this position because of what happened when the Delhi Sultanate came, when the Mughals came. And fake news spread through WhatsApp, through social media and on mainstream media news debates. That helps create an atmosphere of hatred, anger, desperation, which then translates on the uh, ground into one organized attacks and but support for those organized attacks widespread support for those organized attacks there are of course many elements to this phenomenon that's of religious violence and the economy is just one of them 
Nonetheless, it remains to be seen if those in power can actually address these issues rather than promoting religious rivalry and violence for narrow political gains. We now move to the state of Tamil Nadu. The state is well known for its traditional silk garments which are extremely popular both in the country and even abroad. The handloom weaving sector in the state is primarily centered in regions such as Kanjipuram, Tiruvannamalai, Kumbagonam, Salem and Coimbatore. This story is of one family of weavers living in Kanjipuram district. Let's take a look at the conditions of those who work day and night to produce these expensive garments. Many people in Kanjipuram district of Tamil Nadu are engaged in silk weaving. As per various report, there are around 60,000 silk weavers in the district out of whom 50,000 weavers work under the cooperative fold. The Newslick team reached out to the family of Vetrivel who has been involved in handloom weaving for years in Kanjipuram. <laughs> தரல <laughs> தெரிய <laughs> நினைக்கிறேன் <laughs> <laughs> ஒரு நாளைக்கு ஒரு அஞ்சு சடை அப்படி பட்டி அழைப்போம் வீட்டுல இருக்கிறதுனால அஞ்சு சடை அழைக்கிறோம் ஸ்கூலுக்கு போனா ஒண்ணு ரெண்டு அந்த மாதிரி அழைக்கும் அம்மா அப்பாவே கஷ்டப்படுறது போதும் நம்மளும் அதுல போய் கஷ்டப்பட வேண்டாம் நிறைய கடன் இருக்கு வீட்டுல இந்த கொரோனால ரொம்ப நிறைய வாயிடுச்சு அது அதனால Meanwhile, here is Shiva Prakasham, a member of the Handloom Weavers Union under the Centre of Indian Trade Unions or CITU. He is speaking to us about the various demands that Handloom Weavers have from the government. இப்போ இந்த அரசாங்கம் வந்து கைத்தறி தமிழ்நாடு கைத்தறி துறை வந்து தனியார் நெசவாளர்களுக்கான எந்த விதமான ஒரு திட்டமும் கிடையாது இருக்கிற ஒரே ஒரு திட்டம்னு பார்த்தீங்கன்னா தை கைத்தறி நெசவாளருக்கு இரநூறு யூனிட் இர இலவசன்ற ஒரு திட்டத்தை தவிர வேறு எதுவுமே கிடையாது அதே மாதிரி நெசவாளர்களுக்கு மருத்துவ காப்பீடு என்பது சுத்தமாக தனியார் நெசவாளி கிடையாது கூட்டுறவு நெசவாளி கூட இருக்கு ஆனால் அந்த கூட்டுறவு நெசவாளி கூட என்ன பண்ணிட்டாங்கன்னு சொன்னால் இப்போ முதலமைச்சர் காப்பீடு திட்டத்தில் அதை நினச்சிட்டாங்க அதனால் வந்து நெசவாளருக்குன்னு தனியாக ஒரு காப்பீடு மருத்துவ காப்பீடு இருக்கணும் குறிப்பாக தனியார் நெசவாளிக்குன்னு ஒரு தனியாக ஒரு காப்பீடு இருக்கணும் ரெண்டாவது தனியார் நெசவாளிக்கு வந்து பார்த்தீங்கன்னா வேலை செஞ்சு முடித்து அவருடைய வயசான காலத்தில் அவருக்கு அவங்களுக்கான பென்ஷனை வந்து அரசாங்கம் வந்து உத்தரவாதப்படுத்துகிறோம் அந்த உத்தரவாதத்தில் முதலாளியோடு முதலாளியும் அழைத்து பேசி அவங்களுக்கான அந்த பென்ஷன் கொடுக்கறதுக்கான ஏற்பாடை பண்ணணும் பென்ஷன் வந்து இப்போ பார்த்தீங்கன்னா கூட்டு நெசவாளிகளுக்கு ஆயிரம் ரூபா கொடுக்குறாங்க அந்த ஆயிரம் ரூபா கூட வந்து முறையாக கொடுக்கறது இல்லை அந்த ஆயிரம் ரூபான்றது இன்னும் கூடுதலாக உயர்த்தி கொடுக்கணுன்றது எங்களுடைய கோரிக்கை தனியார் நெசவாளர் எந்த வித பாதுகாப்பெல்லாம் இருக்காங்க கூட்டுறவுத்துறை பார்த்தீங்கன்னு சொன்னால் இன்றைக்கி கூட்டுறவுத்துறையில் நலி நலிந்து போயிருக்கு ஒரு நேரத்தில் கூட்டுறவுத்துறை தான் ஓகோன்னு இந்த காஞ்சிபுரத்தில் கொடி கட்டி பறந்தது அப்போ கூட்டுறவுத்துறைக்கிட்ட இருந்து சேலை வாங்கி வித்த முதலாளிலாம் அன்றைக்கி அப்படி வாங்கி விற்றாங்க ஆனால் இன்றைக்கி கூட்டுறவில் வந்து வியாபாரம் என்பது இல்லை உற்பத்தியும் என்பது பெருசாக தொழில் கொடுக்க முடியல சின்ன சின்ன சேலையை நெய்ய சொல்கிறாங்க சின்ன சேலை நெய்யும் போது கூலி என்பது கட்டுப்படி ஆகலை மூவாயிரம் ரூபா நாலாயிரம் ரூபா கூலி வாங்கி அந்த நெசவாள குடும்பத்தை காப்பாற்ற முடியல அதனால் அடிப்படை கூலி குறைஞ்சபட்சம் இந்த அரசாங்கம் பத்தாயிரம் நிர்ணயிக்கணும் ரகத்துக்கு தான் மாதிரியான கூலியை வந்து அட்டவணை போடணும் அப்படின்னு சொல்லி நாங்கள் வந்து அரசாங்கத்திட்ட ஒரு கோரிக்கையை வைக்கிறோம் 
இந்த கொரோனாவில் பாதிச்சிருந்த எங்களுக்கு நீங்கள் இதுவரைக்கும் எந்த நிவாரணம் கொடுக்கல வருங்காலம் இது மாதிரி வந்து இயற்கை பேரிடர் வரும்போது நெசவாளர்களை கூடுதல் கவனம் வச்சு That's all we have time for this week. We'll be back next week with more news and views from India. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Thank you.